everyone. Welcome to the 2021 International E-Conference on the Historical Jesus. Now, today's theme, with the exception of a couple of presentations, is all about a discussion on what's known as Jesus mythicism. My name is Dr. Darren Slade, and I'm the president of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is hosting this year's academic conference. And one of the great things about GCRR is that you're being joined by students and scholars and specialists from all over the world, right from the comfort and safety of your own home. I want to remind everybody that there is a downloadable PDF file that was created specially for you and this conference uh, by the Scholars' Choice Organization. So four separate book publishers including Baker Academic and SBL Press, have given each of you a special discount code up to 40% off to use on books related to the historical Jesus. So all you have to do is go back to the GCRR website, go back to the historical Jesus event webpage, and click on the Scholar's Choice logo that's near the top of that webpage, and you'll be able to download the PDF. And the last thing I want to talk about is the Global Center for Religious Research has established the most comprehensive international research group to study the causes, manifestations, and treatment options for those suffering from religious trauma. The GCRR has built a team of approximately 30 licensed psychiatrists, therapists, sociologists, uh, university researchers, religion scholars, and PhD candidates from all over the world, most of whom specialize in the field of trauma research. Uh, but we have a really big problem. See, in order for victims of religious trauma to receive help, we need to arrive at a place in our culture where religious trauma is accepted as a real mental health condition. And unfortunately, the academic study of religious trauma remains in its infancy when compared to other studies in mental health. That means there are no exhaustive empirical studies to support uh, what we've all experienced in the tens of thousands, that religious trauma exists and is a chronic problem in many religious traditions. So as it stands, really only anecdotal case studies have been published, but nothing substantially empirical. And GCRR intends to correct this gap of knowledge by offering an interdisciplinary and scientific examination of religious trauma. And we're hoping to get your help in supporting this project. We've set up a GoFundMe page in order to crowdsource the world's very first comprehensive sociological study on those traumatized by religion in order to help set Set the stage, the foundational data from which other researchers and counselors can build on in order to get people who suffer from trauma the help that they need. The reason we've set up a GoFundMe is because unfortunately all federal funding to uh, mental health research has come to a screeching halt. And so that's why we've turned to the, to, uh, the public for help. All you have to do is go to GoFundMe.com and search the phrase religious trauma sociological study, or you can click on the link that I'll put in the chat box here shortly. So with that said, I'm very happy to introduce a good friend of mine and our next presenter, David Fitzgerald. Let me get my screen share. There we go. All right. Now, David has a very important talk on why mythicism even matters in the first place. David Fitzgerald is an atheist author, a public speaker, and historical researcher who's been actively investigating the historical Jesus question for over 20 years. He was an associate member of CSER, that's the former Committee for the Scientific Examination of Religion. He lectures around the world at universities, national secular events, churches, and secular and religious groups, and he's appeared on the Atheist Experience television program and in several documentaries, including Batman and Jesus, My Week in Atheism, and most recently, Marketing the Messiah. So David's latest book is a three-volume set entitled Jesus, Mything in Action. And David's also uh, has a uh, uh, work on science fiction work that's coming out. He's going to tell you a little bit about that. So David, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for putting on this event. It's just been amazing. And thanks to everybody who has survived from six o'clock this morning all the way to now. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody see me okay? You are good to go. All right. Um, let me just, I'm just seeing a blank screen here. So I'll 
I'm going to put it on here. So my original genius plan was that I was going to take my um, talk from the new chapter in the um, upcoming anthology that uh, Robert Price and uh, John Loftus are putting together, The Varieties of Mythicism. And um, the name of my chapter is Why Mythicism Matters or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Jesus Myth Theory. And I still kind of want to do that, but I think after all the 12 hour uh, presentathon we've had today, I might just do something a little different. In fact, I think I'm going to throw out my script, start with the reverse, and then just kind of focus on one of my favorite uh, reasons uh, why mythicism matters. Um, first of all, does mythicism matter? It occurs to me that one of the charges we get constantly is that mythicists are so dogmatic and we're on this crusade to prove Jesus wrong. Um, and I can't think of anybody who's actually like that in the mythicist community. Um, at best, we think it's an interesting um, intellectual pursuit. And if we have a, a dog in the hunt, um, it's not that we have to have Jesus have to has to be a myth um, because it doesn't matter to atheists if Jesus is a myth it does it's not like Christianity is going to start making sense if it turned out there really was a failed apocalyptic prophet named Jesus or some other variation of all the historical Jesuses we've had uh, given to us over the years um people will say that we're bucking the consensus that came up earlier in one of the presentations. And I can't tell you how many times we've been hit with that. Um, and here's the thing, mythicism will never be mainstream. Mythicism will always be on the fringe. It will always be bucking the consensus because especially in Jesus studies, if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God and ascended to heaven on the third day and sits on the right hand of, of the throne of heaven, you're already bucking the consensus for, for Jesus uh, historicists. Um, and even if you un include just the secular historicists, as was also brought up earlier today, um, there is no consensus on who that secular Jesus is. Um, but as soon as you get uh, biblical scholars into a room, it's instantly split down the middle between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus the, of history. Um, that said, I do think it's important for us to explore mythicism. I don't think it's, in, it's a useful strategy to tell your friends who are Christian to try to get them on our side. That's been mentioned today too. Um, and yet, I still think it's worth the uh, the debate. It's not worth debating Christians about it, but it is worth debating atheists. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the chapter. Um, again, this is come from the upcoming anthology, Varieties of Mythicism. Why Mythicism Matters, reason number seven, the best reason of all. Here's why you should love Jesus' myth theory too. Critics fail to appreciate the simple value that comes from the mythicist historicist debate regardless of which side prevails. For all the pious hysteria over evolutionary theory, Christians increasingly are finding they can wiggle and reinterpret their faith to accommodate Darwin's unavoidable truth of natural selection, the delightfully oxymoronic theistic evolution. However, Christians can't play that game with mythicism. Jesus' myth theory is kryptonite for Christianity. Unlike us, they can't even enjoy a relaxed agnosticism about the mere possibility of mythicism being true. They need Jesus not to be a myth, which is really too bad for them because unfortunately, Jesus is a myth. And that remains true no matter whether it's the mythicist camp or the historicist camp that ultimately comes out on top. The believer's Jesus of faith gets debunked either way. Atheists who roll their eyes and wonder why mythicism just doesn't seem to be going away might be relieved to say that, might be relieved to realize that. I find myself constantly quoting Robert Price's apt observation that whether or not there had been an actual Jesus, 
for all intents and purposes, there isn't one anymore because everything we think we know about that elusive figure comes to us from a handful of much later, deeply problematic writings that have no connection to anyone who actually lived in the first century. And again, this is the case, whether a real Jesus ever existed or not, even whether Christianity is true or not. But what is important about this argument and what does make it worthwhile for secular humanists of all stripes to argue about the details is that when one actually takes the trouble to look into the matter, it's valuable and fascinating to see where Christianity really came from and to discover just how remarkably shaky its foundations actually are. And if nothing else, the debate reveals the limits of just what we can and can't know about who or what or if Jesus really was. Everything we learn in the back and forth of this historical argument helps you call the bluff of anyone who tries to tell you they know how Jesus wants you to behave or think or vote. And that by itself is a very good thing for all of us to know. The chapter goes on a lot further. I, again, there's six other things in here um, that talk about what it would take um, for me to be a historicist, what it would take, um, just what all the, the, the top six, seven reasons that uh, I think everyone needs to be at least agnostic about uh, mythicism, if nothing else. But tonight, one thing I really wanna do is share something that I only touch on in the actual essay. And that's something I promised when uh, I was pimping out this uh, conference on uh, Facebook, that I would have something that was information and new for both diehard historicists and diehard mythicists. And this is what it is. Let me see if I can cut to my slideshow and hang on, I need to share screen. Here we go. Here we go. There's a dirty secret. Can everybody see the screen? You are good to go. Awesome. There's a dirty secret in mythicism. Um, it seems like even atheists can't quite wrap their heads around the thought that Christianity started out of nothing with a, a mythical founder. And what I want to, one of the things that surprised me the most when I wrote Nailed in 2010 was not the reaction we got from the Christians, of course they hated it, but it was from the atheists who tried to say that, oh no, no, that's like Holocaust denial. That's like moon landing denial, flat eartherism. It set off all the red flags for their uh, pseudoscience, pseudo history. And I still get hit with that fairly regularly. But I won't go into all the reasons uh, tonight about why I don't think that's the case, but I will go deeper into this one. And that's the fact that Jesus isn't the only one who has this same problem. Christianity is not the only religion that has this problem. Um, one of the biggest surprises I got from writing the book Nailed was to have ex-Muslims and Buddhists come up to me and tell me, yeah, we're having the same debates in our circles. And that kind of blew my mind because it's like, you know, sure, Buddha, but Muhammad? And then they start explaining why. And I want to share some of those reasons. If I can get my screen share to screen. Here we go. Well, let's start with Christianity. Um, one of the, the, the main points here is that we've got the death of Jesus, supposedly in the year 30, 33. We can't really pin down any single incident in Jesus his life with any kind of certainty. Uh, 20 earliest writings, assuming that's when they were written and assuming they were generally written by Paul. Um, in the 70s, we get our first gospel, Mark, written. So we're already a couple generations from the, the, um, from the event, the alleged event. Um, and it gets even worse when you get into the second century and in the third century. In the mid to late second century, we still have only tiny fragments of New Testament texts. And it's not until the beginning of the third century, around that time, that we get our first complete 
New Testament books. And in the fourth century, uh, when we get our first complete New Testament collections, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And the only problem with that is Vaticanus and Sinaiticus don't have the same books. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus don't have the same books we have in our Bibles. We have books they don't have. They have books we don't have. And there's a bigger problem even than that. It's the blackout period with all these tiny fragments not showing up until the mid second century or later. Um, we don't have any way to know whether what was originally written back in the first century matches what we have today. We only have, as Bart Ehrman says, copies of copies of copies. And you might even say we have fragments of fragments of fragments. But we have no way of knowing, even if somehow someone magically preserved one of Paul's letters, put it in a lockbox, and we only just found it, we would have no way of knowing that was the original writing. We would say, oh, here's an interesting variant reading of Paul's, one of Paul's letters. Um, even um, Bible-believing, devout biblical scholars who have our current texts can't decide in many cases which is the actual reading that is original and which is the actual reading that they prefer. Um, they have no way of telling which is the one um, that came first. I want to back up just a little bit if I can before we go into Islam. Um, are we talking about how it, uh, mythicism will never be mainstream? And one thing that constantly gets thrown in our face is well, secular scholars like uh, Bart Ehrman, they don't agree with anything we say. I get that thrown all the time at me. But in fact, mythicists and historicists, for the most part, agree on everything. We agree on the synoptic problem. We agree on interpolations. We agree on mark and priority. We agree on the, the degree of forgery in the New Testament. Um, recently, I was asked to, to review a book of um, Bart Ehrman's debate with Craig Evans, uh, which was moderated by Robert B. Stewart. And in this tiny book of this, uh, this debate, a third of it is Robert Stewart setting up the stage for us. Um, then Bart Ehrman talks, then Craig Evans talks, and the debate continues from there. Um, when I re read this book and reviewed it, it sounded like I was debating Craig Evans because uh, on the subject of can we trust the Bible on the historical Jesus, Bart Ehrman and I are lockstep on the same page. And I suspect it's the same with all of you as well. He argued very convincingly that we cannot uh, trust the, the book, trust the New Testament as historically reliable. Whether Christianity is true or not, whether there is a Jesus or not, those stories, those myths are not going to tell us anything true about it. All right, let us go back to uh, Islam. Um, yeah, to have an ex-Muslim tell me he didn't think Mus Muhammad exists blew my mind. And then he started explaining why. Um, if you look at the top here, around 570 to 632, Muhammad is meant to have lived and died. Uh, right after that, the caliphate was established in, in Mecca and Medina. Um, the Arab conquest began, and for the next 20 years, um, there's just on a complete Islamic jihad, if you will, um, conquesting, uh, spreading conquests throughout the Middle Ages. And according to the traditional um, view, in the, around the 650s, the Quran was finally finished and distributed. Um, again, about 20 years after Muhammad's death. Fair enough. Now, oddly enough, uh, the early eighth century is the first mention of the Quran. And the mid eighth century is the first complete biogra biography of Muhammad, 125 years after his death. And that's not even the weirdest thing. What's really weird is what happened 60 years or so after the death of Muhammad, during the reign of Caliph Abdul al-Malik. During his reign, we first start hearing 
about Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and in fact, the religion of Islam. In nine, no, sorry, in 696, Islamic beliefs first start appearing on coins and inscriptions. But before this, we have at least three different coins that show crosses in Islamic uh, coinage. Around this time, Arabic became the primary written language of the Arabian Empire, beating Syriac and Greek. And common Muslim practices like reciting from the Quran during mosque prayers begin, again, 60 years after the death of Muhammad. Abdul Malik also claims in passing to have collected the Quran together, something that the Caliph Uthman was supposed to have done 40 years before. And multiple hadiths report that his governor of Iraq, Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, edited and distributed the Quran, again, what was supposed to have already happened 40 years prior. How about Judaism? Now, if you go into the, the traditional uh, table of contents for, 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 Judea, for the, your Old Testament, you start with the creation. You start with the, the Garden of Eden, the flood, the Tower of Babel, um, goes into the Abraham and the patriarchs, and then Moses and Joshua and the, the Exodus and the, the conquest of Canaan, and then on into the monarchy of, of Saul, David, Solomon, all these things down the line. Um, then there's some boring figures that we don't really always uh, pay attention to. The Amrides dynasty, uh, Ahab and Jezebel are probably the most famous of those two. And there's the prophets like Amos and Hosea, King Hezekiah, King Josiah. Um, and then there's the Babylonian conquest and the post-exilic period. But when we put all these things on the map and ask somebody like, uh, Tel Aviv archaeologist Israel Finkelstein and Neil Silberman, it turns out, well, actually, we have zero evidence of Abraham and the patriarchs, zero evidence of Exodus or the conquest. We have lots of evidence for the Late Bronze Age. We have lots of evidence for the Iron Age. We have, even have evidence for the Neolithic Age, and we can spot um, camel tracks, you know, by satellite now, but we have found not a scrap to document Abraham, the patriarchs, Exodus, conquest, or most of our most favorite beloved Old Testament stories. And as for Saul and David and Solomon, they were probably real people, but all the evidence we have for their kingdom doesn't look so much like a kingdom as it does a, a um, bandit king jumped up into a kind of a, a cow town. Um, and there's so many anachronisms in the story of David and Solomon's reign that are coming from at least 300 years later. Um, and some people like Russell Gamerican argue that those, some of those uh, stories are even coming from a later period, uh, not just the Persian period or Babylonian period, but the Hellenistic period in Alexandria. And this is not the only ones, again, Buddhism. The death of Buddha was in the 10th century, depending if you're talking to the Eastern traditions in China, Korea, and Vietnam. In the 9th century, according to Tibetan traditions, uh, he died. Or according to early 20th century historians, in the 6th century. Or uh, according to Nedanka, Nedandanka uh, traditions, in the 5th century, later in the 5th century. Um, uh, and later 20th century says, no, no, it was in the year 411, 400, around that time. And it's not until the third century BCE that we get an actual mention of Buddhism. Uh, and it's not until the second century uh, CE slash AD, if you will, that the first biography of Buddha is written in the early second century. And this pattern continues. Lao Tzu, uh, the the, the uh, alleged uh, founder of Taoism um, is said to live in the sixth or the fifth, but virtually all the facts of his life are in dispute. And the prominent view among scholars today is that his Tao Te Ching is a compilation of multiple authors over a century or two. Likewise, in Confucianism, Master Kong, aka Kung Fu Tzu or Kung Fu Tzu, is said to have been a fifth century BC figure, though his earliest biography appears 400 years after his death. And the Analects, the writings attributed to him and other ancient traditions, 
was actually composed sometime in the Warring States period after his death and reached its final form during the Han Dynasty in 200 BC, uh, from 200 B or so BC to 220 AD. The Baha'i faith in Mormons. The Baha'i faith is a spinoff of Babism or the Babi faith, which itself is a spinoff of Shia Islam. So that kind of gets debunked under the, the Muslim uh, purview. Mormonism, of course, is a spinoff of Christianity, though it's worth noting that its founders include the mythical prophet Mormon and the angel Moroni. Shinto and Hinduism are interesting. They're both considered two of the oldest religions in the world. And historically, the Hinduism is considered a fusion of multiple Indian cultures over millennia and Shinto emerging from the beliefs and practices of historic Japan. And so there is no single founder figure of Hinduism or Shinto. Then there's Jainism. And um, with all respect to my good friend, Hemet Mehta, who's the only ex-Jain I know, I don't know how anybody takes this religion seriously. Rishabhanatha was the first of 24 Jain Tirthankara teachers. He was born millions and millions of years ago, according to Orthodox Jain teaching, lived for 8.2 million purva years. One purva year, of course, as we know, is equal to 8.4 million years squared in Western reckoning. Uh, and he's also 4,950 feet tall. Um, after a series of 23 more of them, in the ninth century BC, Parshvanatha is born. He's 13 and a half feet tall and lives for 100 years. In the sixth century BC, in 599 BC, Mahavira, the 24th and final one, is, uh, is born. But somehow, a century later, his teachings were all gradually lost, and we have to go again for hundreds of years before his writings actually appear. Sikhism. When I started doing this uh, chart, it was for a talk I gave for the Recovering from Religion Foundation. And I was just looking into, out of idle curiosity, Sikhism. Not that I expected it to follow this pattern because Sikhism is much younger than any of these other religions. It's, it's uh, the first founding figure, Guru Nanak, was born in 1469, died in 1539. Um, he was the first of 10 of these gurus that are the ones who put together, at least the first five, put together uh, Sikh scriptures. But it actually turns out a funny fact that it actually looks like it's the fifth one halfway down this list, list of 10 who really put together the scriptures. Um, in 1604, Guru Arjan compiled the first version of the Hindu scriptures, the, Ar the Adi Granth. Um, and Janam Saki's The Stories of Guru Nanak began to appear 50 to 80 years after his death. Um, and then many more come in the 17th century, in the 18th century, and even in the early 19th century. And then at the beginning of the 18th century in 1704, the final edition of Sikh scriptures came together, the Guru Granth Sahib. Um, and there are five different competing historical uh, theories on how this was put together. Of the secular ones, the, the three of them blend together and basically are just um, enhancements of each other, saying that that uh, that the scriptures were put together by Guru Arjan and a couple of others, his contemporaries and some people who came after him. And there are other questionable figures in history that have nothing to do with religion. Uh, well, Homer, of course, is a prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, sorry, Isaiah is a prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, but like Homer, uh, Aesop. Pythagoras, Lycurgus of Sparta, he seems to be a multiple author. Um, and some of these guys, um, like also Solomon could be lumped into this, seem to be clearing houses, repertoires. <laughs>